Hi, this is Jeff Heaton. Welcome to the spring 2020 semester of applications of deep neural networks with Washington University. During this semester, we're going to learn about TensorFlow, Keras, and deep learning in general. We're going to see how to do this both on CPUs and GPUs. We'll be using the very latest TensorFlow 2.0 available from Google. To see all my videos about Kaggle, neural networks, and other AI topics, click the subscribe button and the bell next to it and select all to be notified of every new video. So this is a hybrid course. That means that there are four meetings that occur here at the campus at Washington University. There you will be expected to be in person. Those are four required meetings. If you're watching these videos from the internet, obviously you can't attend those because you're not students of Washington University. You can follow along really on everything in the class. You just can't submit assignments to me for grading, but you can actually compete in the Kaggle competition that we have coming on later. There's usually a couple of students that join from the internet for the Kaggle competition. This is my page at Washington University. You can find this easily just by Googling Jeff Heaton, uh, W-U-S-T-L, and it has links to sort of everything related to me and Washington University. I am an adjunct instructor at Washington University. I really teach just this one class in deep learning. My primary job is as as a vice president of data science at Reinsurance Group of America. That's a company here in St. Louis. The class that you are in is T81558, Applications of Deep Neural Networks. If you're a Washington University student, you also have access to the Canvas system. This is where I put all the official grades so that you know exactly what your grade is up to any point in this semester. I keep Canvas very up to date. It is the system of record. What Canvas says your grade is, is what your grade will be in this class. This is the course description. You've seen this in the catalog. Essentially, this class is about TensorFlow and Keras and some of the coolest technologies available in deep learning. I try to focus this course on what makes deep learning different than traditional machine learning techniques like support vector machines and linear regression, random forests, the other trees. What really makes deep learning different is the fact that it can deal with such multimedia like computer vision, images, sound, and even generate images. We'll do some of the traditional data science with deep learning so that we will use it as though deep learning is a random forest or just a typical classification regression model, but we'll also go much deeper into that. Deep learning, a GPU, graphic processing unit, is very important if you want to be able to run your programs with any degree of speed whatsoever, especially once we get past the tabular data, the traditional stuff. You really have two options here. One is to use a GPU on your own computer or install all of this onto your own computer. I have videos that cover all of that. Setting up a GPU can be somewhat difficult because it involves using low-level drivers and this sort of thing. You have to set up really three different types of driver to actually get this to work, and you have to have a NVIDIA CUDA compatible GPU. It's all covered in my video on how to set up such an environment, but really my suggested path is to use something called Google Colab. We'll see more about that in upcoming videos and I'll demonstrate it the first night of class. I have a link here to the GitHub repository. Everything for this course is on GitHub. And this is the GitHub repository for this class. This lets you see really all the changes and everything for this class over really the last three years that I've taught it. You'll see that I make changes to this quite frequently, especially in the middle of semesters, like right now when I'm recording this in early, early January 2020. I will likely make changes as the course goes through, as people ask questions and I make clarifications. So GET is particularly good for that. You will be able to track the changes. If you star my repository up here, you'll be notified of any changes if you star and watch it. At the bottom, I have a readme file. This contains the schedule and links to all of the source code. So you can browse it from the source code up here, or you can go to the individual module links and it'll take you to that. So like module one, for example, module one, each of the modules like module one has five parts, and those are the files. And these are IPYNB files. So those are Jupyter Notebook files. We will use Jupyter Notebook extensively throughout this class. Jupyter Notebook, we'll see it in a 
moment is a way that you can combine text, graphics, and code all in one. Believe me, Jupyter Notebook is used extensively in the real world. We use data science platforms at my company that basically dynamically create Jupyter Notebooks on very high-end machines, and this means that the data scientist just gets handed the notebook and doesn't have to actually deal with the low-level intricacies of GPUs or whatever that high-capacity machine that we're spending up for them has. Let's go through Module 1.1. 1 .1. I'll go through this relatively quickly in the video, and then the first night of class we'll go through this in greater detail, also with the grading aspects of this class and things unique to students taking this through Washington University. So each of the modules is going to have five parts. They're all uniform in that way. There's a link that takes you to the video. There's a link that takes you to the notebook. So if you clicked on this, this would take you to the same page you're already on. But you can jump, say, to the notebook for part two, three, four, or five by clicking those links. All the videos are on my YouTube channel. I really started putting together a YouTube channel when I began this class about three years ago. Wasn't really expecting to actually have a YouTube channel per se, but I'm a, I guess I'm a part-time YouTuber. I'm up to 23.6 thousand subscribers. So there's definitely interest in YouTube and this on the internet. So if you want to be informed whenever I put out another video, most of the videos are already there that we're going to see this semester, but I may update something. It just all depends. Or I may provide additional videos that might be helpful to you. Definitely subscribe to my channel if you would like to get those notifications. Now, as far as making use of these modules, you'll need to have Python installed somewhere and Kara's TensorFlow 2.0. We are using absolutely the latest stuff. We're using TensorFlow 2.0 and we're using the latest of all the libraries. So believe me, that is considerable work in between the semesters. This stuff changes at the speed of light, but I try to keep the course as up to date as possible. So even after you're done with this course, you may want to look back to see if a particular topic that you're interested in has changed over the months or years since you've taken the class. Also starring the repository and subscribing for updates will let you know as, as I change things. Now as far as installing Python so that you have this available, these bottom three links will be the most useful for you if you want to install it on your own computer. Here I have the instructions for Windows, the instructions for Mac. I do have students who actually have Linux for the desktop installed on their computers. And the Mac instructions are actually fairly similar to the Linux instructions, but not exactly. I will probably do an Ubuntu tutorial on how to install it at some point. Usually the students that are brave enough to have Ubuntu running on their laptop that they take to class are no stranger to setting these kind of things up and, and get through it just fine. But I probably will do a Ubuntu video on that at some point. This is the most complicated one. If you want to actually use your own G GPU and you have a NVIDIA CUDA compatible GPU. Here I show you literally how I set up all the drivers and go through the process. There's three different classes of driver that you have to actually install to do this before you even install Python. So it's a bit more complex. If you use the Google Colab environment that I mentioned before, you actually get about a $900 GPU that you have access to. It's it will speed up some of the things in this course considerably. I have one program we'll see later in the semester that takes an hour without the Google Colab GPU. With the Google Colab GPU, it runs just about a minute or two. So it's it's worth definitely worth looking at. And I will demonstrate Google Colab. I demonstrated it both in this linked video here and I'll demonstrate it in the class. How to submit assignments, definitely look at that. There are 10 module assignments that you will submit. You'll get your grade in Canvas, but you will actually submit them through an API that I have. This is because these are weekly assignments. So this lets you check your progress and I literally give you the feedback instantly because it's auto-corrected. These are auto-corrected, auto-assessed, and you can resubmit. And I will only grade your final submission once the due date passes. So using Google Colab with this, most of these modules will have this at the beginning, Google Colab instructions. If you're running this locally, that's what this try accept is for. You'll just blow through it and not do anything. It'll say note, 
not using Google Colab. The versions of these notepads that you're looking at were mostly run on my local computer. So you will see this output. When you go and rerun them, you'll see your own output. You'll also notice when you're viewing these on GitHub or viewing them anywhere, there's this little icon that I put up here. That's really just an HTML link. It's nothing fancy about it, but it is kind of handy. If you're in GitHub, so you're on my GitHub site, you can't just run this. This is view only. But if you click open in Colab, then all of a sudden it opens up another window. It expects you to log in through Google. And now look at this. We can actually run it. See how it says note not using Google Colab. If I click run, yeah, it says it's not authored by Google. It's authored by me. And I trust me actually more than Google. So that's good run anyway. So it is now running that. And it now says note using Google Colab. If you want to change the runtime, you go into change runtime type. If things are going slow, you'll definitely want to kick in that GPU. Don't worry about the TPU. That's a Google proprietary sort of hardware that does the same similar sorts of things as the GPU. I don't really cover TPUs on my course because they are Google proprietary. That may change in future semesters. I cover TensorFlow, but not TPUs. Okay, so this is how you'll be graded for the class. I'll go into this in more detail at the first meeting. These are your 10 assignments. These are the module assignments. There's other assignments that are due. One of the biggest things is the Kaggle competition, which students always have a lot of fun with. I haven't posted the Kaggle competition for this semester because I'm still figuring out what data set I want to use. It's a new challenge every single time. So I, I completely recreate that from scratch every time we have the course. This is me. I will be your instructor. I have a Master of Information Management from here at Washington University. I also have a PhD in Computer Science from Nova Southeastern University. I am a Vice President and Data Scientist at Reinsurance Group of America. That is a Fortune 300 company here in St. Louis. I'm a senior member of IEEE. And that's my email address and some of my other mostly industry-related certifications. These are links to some of the social media that I use, and these are other resources that will be helpful to you for this course. So deep learning, what is deep learning? I have seen so many write-ups and articles going way deeper into this than I would think is needed about what is the difference between artificial intelligence, between machine learning, between deep learning, and all of this. Fundamentally, deep learning is neural networks, and it is simply additional training techniques that came on right around 2006 and beyond that finally let us create neural networks that had a lot of layers and train them effectively. But fundamentally, deep learning is neural networks trained by gradient descent type algorithms, and that's, that's really it. There's all sorts of add-ons to that for computer vision and other things. Machine learning, to me, that's a subset of artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is sort of the grand daddy discipline of all of these, but machine learning is is really letting the machine learn from data. So traditional data, you would have input data and you would write a program for that input data. You'd give both of those to the computer and it would crunch out some data. Machine learning, or at least the training portion of it, the scoring portion works a lot like this, but the training portion is where you give it the data, you give it the expected output, and the computer gives you the program code or the model, essentially the, the weights of the neural network. These are some of the three main categories of problems that we'll look at this semester. So predictive modeling, this is sometimes called tabular data. It's still very important. I do a lot of this. I do a lot of this one and time series. I don't do as much computer vision in my day-to-day -day job working in the insurance industry. But predictive modeling, this is where you essentially think of Microsoft Excel. You've got several columns and you decide to use existing rows to predict one of those columns. Time series is essentially these rows now are events in time. So like a stock price, maybe another stock price and you're trying to predict the future. Can you predict the stock market with neural networks? I'm sure some people are relatively good at that, but I would probably be on a beach somewhere if I had that completely figured out. What is really neat about deep learning is when you deal with other models like random forests and support vector machines, traditional machine learning, you have regression and classification, and it's typically one or the other. Neural networks go beyond that. They can be both classification and regression at the same time. You can output a regression number and a classification number, or classification class, if you so desire. The input and output can be nearly anything. The input and output to a neural network can be an image. So it can input an image, it can also output an image. It can be a series of numbers that would 
would be interpreted as text, audio, or some other time series. So if you think about it, audio is very much time series, because if you took the graph of my voice as I'm speaking to you, you would see a wave, essentially, for the, for the audio. That turns into a series of numbers that can be predicted similar to finance and other time series data. And then it can also be a regression or classification. Regression is when you're having your model output a number that you're trying to predict, like approximating a mathematical function. Classification is where you're having it give you the probability of the input being of one particular class or several classes, if, because you'll get a probability usually for each of the classes. These four individuals here are the luminaries of the field of deep learning. The three that are standing over here actually won the Turing Prize for their contributions. The Turing Prize is essentially the Nobel Prize of computer science, but all of these guys are, have made amazing contributions to this field. Jan LeKern, Jeffrey Hinton, I mean, Jeffrey Hinton is somewhat the grandfather of the backpropagation algorithm and deep learning and everything. His name also sounds somewhat like me, mine, Jeffrey Heaton, Jeffrey Hinton. I did not plan it that way. I guess I could say my parents were big fans of him, but he would have been just starting at that point. Why deep learning? So this is a diagram from Andrew Ning. Older algorithms will typically outperform deep learning, at least when there's not so much data. There's a lot of things I don't particularly like about this chart, but this chart does really capture what I have seen, at least up to maybe around here. If you have just classic data, tabular data, and you're trying to predict something on it, probably a gradient boosted machine, a GBM, like an XGBoost, or a light GBM is going to outperform just about anything the neural network is going to do for you. And we'll see that when we get to the Kaggle competitions in this class. But when you start to get a lot of data, deep learning tends to really excel. And if the data is not simply tabular, you may not have any choice but to use deep learning or just feature engineer, pre-process essentially the heck out of your data before you even send it into the model. Deep learning means that you don't have to try to extract all these features out of images and other things where you basically try to turn data like images. So you might try to find patterns and somehow produce a table output from each of your images. There's tons of algorithms from before the days of deep learning that attempt to do that. By the way, the things I don't like about this chart is there's no numbers. We don't know if we're log scale or anything. And what's it bounded by? I guarantee you that that, no, that line does not extend and deep learning just gets better and better and better. It, it, it plateaus as well. Believe me, I've seen it. And the older algorithms, okay, so that has reached a plateau or I guess an asymptote. So it, it probably isn't going to do anything further. So I believe this is somewhat optimistic, but again, he's one of the luminaries of deep learning. So when you have a luminary introducing their favorite algorithm. It's essentially theirs versus older algorithms. It's interesting also calling the some of the other algorithms older because research is ongoing in many of these areas for the competitors of deep learning. So we will use Python. Python has been hitting the world like crazy, even moving into classic IT, but it has dominated machine learning, AI, and data science for a number of years. For classical statistics, R is still a strong competitor to Python, but if you're doing heavy duty machine learning, AI, this kind of thing, you're probably working in Python. I have the instructions here for how to install Python and TensorFlow. Those videos that I showed you, near the top of this document refer to here. So I'm not going to take you through this because you would be going through the, the instructions in my video. Now what I do give you that is very handy is I give you a YAML script that you can run under Minaconda, which is a minimal type of Anaconda. So that's the version of Python that I recommend you use. And this is essentially an install script that has a manifest of everything I want installed for this class. And I update this semester to semester. So we are able to use the full Python 3.7, which is the latest of Python. Python. Very often I'll be supporting a new version of TensorFlow that doesn't support the latest of Python, so you have to play a little bit of a shell game with the versions to make sure everything lines up. But this is something that I have tested on Mac, Windows, and Linux just before the semester started, and this, this works quite well. There are some incompatibilities that I am finalizing, fixing on the reinforcement learning, but by the time we get to that module, I will have updated it. 
everything else I have updated. Believe me, the 2.0 changes in TensorFlow was rough. There were a lot of things that broke. Okay, so Jupyter Notebooks, you can even put LaTeX formulas in them. That's kind of nice. That's what we'll be using. This little bit of code here, I encourage you to use to test my videos where I tell you how to install. Actually, this is what we actually run to test it. Let's see, if I change my runtime type and I enable the GPU, believe me, that little step that I did there just to install a GPU manually is probably about an hour's worth of work if everything works right. Okay, so I'm going to run this. Notice this says GPU is not available. That was from the last time that I ran this. I'm running it now under TensorFlow and it says GPU is available. Now, this little warning that you get here, I'm only getting this because I ran my code out of order. Colab currently is defaulting to the older 1.x. If we go up to the top, that's why I have this. I didn't run this part first. If I would have ran that part first, we would have had our version specified and you would have not got the red warning. I actually did that on purpose, honest, so that I could show you this warning because you will definitely see this warning. You can click this upgrade and then it makes the default as 2.0. I haven't upgraded mine because I just want to see how long until they force everybody to 2.0 because then I can adjust my class's instructions. But if you want to click and upgrade it, feel free. You can still run the old version. You just change, you just use this magic. By the way, magic refers to any command that you give in Jupyter Notebooks that starts with a percent. We'll see several magics throughout this course. All right, at this point, I suggest the first thing to work on is get your first assignment submitted. It's really pretty easy. It You just have to run the program. You don't even have to make any changes. You basically copy and paste your key into at the API key that I send you and run it and you're done. The first assignment is basically just to make sure that you have gotten your Python environment up and running or Colab or whatever you are going to use and that you got your API key and you know how to submit assignments. Thank you for watching the video. In these first two modules, we're going to just get used to the Python programming language and in the next module also Pandas, which we'll use extensively for data processing to get data in and out of the deep neural networks that we're going to deal with. Later on, we'll deal with images, time series, and things that don't fit so nicely into the tabular data that Pandas expects. But for now, we'll start with Pandas and an introduction to the Python programming language. Thank you for watching, and if you want to stay up to date with all of my videos, please subscribe to my channel. Thank you very much.